The unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. I'm going to introduce our topic tonight. And um, first I'm going to begin with talking a little about our Kesa verse. And as you know, as Buddhists in our tradition, the Kesa verse is recited daily at the end of morning meditation. How great and wondrous are the clothes of enlightenment, formless and embracing every treasure. I wish to unfold the Buddha's teaching that I may help all living things. So we begin the day by awakening our bodhicitta and going straight to meditation, invoking the wish to become one with eternal Buddha nature, or however you like to think of it. And the Kesa verse beautifully expresses this true wish and commitment to train ourselves in the precepts for the day, placing the robe of this path above our personal selves, giving it the train, that, that is the training, the greatest reverence, and making it the foremost focus of our lives. In meditation, previous to reciting this, we've come to know that there truly is no separate self apart from the Buddha heart, mind, and that it embraces every treasure. Unfolding this truth is our work of the day as Buddhist trainees, and we dedicate it each morning for the benefit of all living things, that we and all things may realize the highest truth together. So thus we begin the day by dedicating ourselves to walking the Buddha way and doing the training of a bodhisattva. In particular, I I deeply appreciate the meaning expressed in our Kesa verse of our perceptual training being formless, um, nothing special yet boundless, but also embracing every treasure. To me, this speaks of cultivating a willingness to see into the heart of things as they really are, trusting Buddha nature, the pure source of every thought, thing, and being, As we keep going in our daily practice, doing the best we can, we convert the greeds, hates, and confusions that have clouded up this pure heart, those poisons that bind us up, and thereby we unlock the gateway to the numberless treasures of the source. This, for me, is cause for great joy and seems a vital and integral aspect of bodhisattva training. We're not training just for self-improvement, personal growth, or even self-enlightenment in a sense. In other words, to get a better or a perfect self, but are willing to do something about ourselves so that we and all beings may be freed from suffering. From my experience, it's a matter of the training gradually dissolving the clinging to a sense of a separate or special self, a selfish self, if you like, and an opening to that which is now and which works. So as we help ourselves unlock the door to our own treasure house within, we naturally begin to see and appreciate the treasures all around us and to find ways of doing what is truly helpful in bringing these forth. Well, let's talk a little bit about what what do we mean by bodhisattvas? What is a bodhisattva? Most of you know what this means, but it doesn't hurt to look at it through a different window now and then. The Buddha talked of his cultivating the mind and heart of a bodhisattva over many, many lifetimes. Uh, It's said that he practiced the paramitas throughout countless lives, perfecting the virtues of helping himself and other beings cross over the sea 
of suffering to the other shore of liberation. He seemed to view his training as having gone on for a very long time and the merit of that training coming to fruition in his present life, aiding him in becoming a Buddha. It's said that that which brought him to becoming Buddha, a fully awakened being, was the continued bodhisattva practice of almsgiving and generosity of spirit, following the precepts and positive self-discipline, meditation, stillness, practicing patience, steadfast vigor, trusting the highest wisdom, and other paramitas. He recognized his present life as Shakyamuni, that it was not only reaping the merit of his own training, but also the training of many, many beings that came before whose practice of the liberating virtues ripened into full enlightenment in his current life. He then continued this bodhisattva practice beyond enlightenment, showing others how to do it until the time of his death, his entering into eternal meditation or parinirvana. Reverend Master Ji recommended to her disciples that in order to truly understand what it means to train as a bodhisattva and what it means to take bodhisattva vows, one should read and reflect carefully on the Jatakamala, the the garland of birth stories or past lives of the Buddha that he shared with his disciples so many years ago when, when he was teaching them. These stories offer many examples of the bodhisattva letting go of clinging to a separate self, and thereby being of great benefit spiritually and physically to other beings, whether human, animal, or otherwise. One such story from the Jataka Tales, which is one of my favorites, is that of the Bodhisattva in a life as a wealthy man, the head of a guild, who was in the habit of giving alms generously to all the mendicants who came to his door. When a Prateka Buddha came to beg at his house once, the Bodhisattva asked his wife to offer the meal that had just been prepared for the family. However, she turned back from the doorway in terror as Mara, attempting to foil the Bodhisattva's charity, created a great chasm of hellish flames with beings in the depths of it crying in agony. The Bodhisattva determined not to turn the monk away without an offering, then went to the door himself and realized that it was Mara, the tempter, presenting presenting himself in a splendorous body as trying to help the man with the argument that he was attached to charity, thus destroying his wealth, which interestingly, according to some um, Brahmanical ideals at that time, was the root of dharma. In other words, having wealth was the root of dharma as it made sacrifices to the gods possible. So in other words, there there was a controversy at the time. Apparently, one couldn't practice successfully without possession of goods. So therefore, you had to keep lots of, keep your wealth. And um, it's interesting how Mara, whom one can understand as the voice of our own doubt or self-centeredness, if you like, how he makes use of common or popular ideas. We can perhaps think of some of our own time in our own uh, lives, uh, things that sound really good, but <laughs> you know, prevent us from doing what our heart really wishes. They try to convince us with logical and sometimes lofty argument to refrain from doing what we know in our hearts to be good. To quote the Jatakamala, the Bodhisattva said to Mara, Sir... Thou must excuse me. I will fall of my own accord into this fiercely blazing hell headlong, a prey to the flames that will lick at me, rather than at the due time of honoring the mendicants who show me their affection by requesting from me, incur the guilt of neglecting them. After so speaking, the Bodhisattva, relying on the power of his destiny or of his merit, and knowing that almsgiving 
cannot at any rate entail evil, stepped forth across the hill without heeding his family and his attendants who were eager to withhold him. His mind was not overcome by terror and his desire of giving was still increased. Then, owing to the power of his merit in the midst of the hell, a lotus sprang up. With its row of stamen teeth, it seemed to laugh contemptuously at Mara. And with the aid of the lotus, produced out of the large amount of his merit, the bodhisattva, having reached the Pracheka Buddha, filled his bowl with food, while his heart was expanding with gladness and joy. And then there's a passage in there about how the monk shows his appreciation by rising into the air and displaying his splendor. While Meanwhile, Mara, on the other hand, seeing that his design was overturned, was in low spirits and accordingly lost his splendor. I think that's an interesting... And he no longer dared look in the face of the bodhisattva and soon he disappeared with his hell. And it sounds very dramatic, but, you know, when you think about it, there are times when we come up to some difficult choices um, where um, something looks very uh, tempting, very tantalizing to us and very big. And, um, and when we, if we have a gut sense that it's not uh, to be paid attention to, it'll shrink and, and just disappear and fade. Have you ever had that experience? I certainly have. And, uh, there are many animal lives in the Jataka stories as well, sometimes as a deer doing bodhisattva training. I was recently at the compassionate friend hermitage. The deer came up almost every day, anywhere from two to, to half a dozen deer. Um, and I like to feed on the grasses around the house, and they're very um, tame, not afraid of, of me at all or of, of the monks there. So one is able to watch them and to see some this real benevolent quality about deer. One such example, which the Buddha taught the last disciple he ordained, was of a past life in which he was a deer living in a forest with many other animals when a forest fire broke out. You might know this one. All the creatures became very distressed and started to panic, wondering how they could escape the flames. Because he had been an attentive creature and had been practicing meditation and mindfulness, this great deer came up with the idea to stretch his body across a nearby stream. So by forming a bridge with his own body, he was able to rescue all the forest creatures from fire. Because the deer had learned the stillness of meditation, another one of the paramitas, He was able to do just what was needed to be done to avert disaster. And we often um, don't value our meditation practice, our practice of mindfulness, perhaps enough. We may not see the dramatic results of it, but we, and we don't always see the disasters that are averted as well. In our own lives, these stories uh, cause me to think, in our own lives, that we can and should appreciate and recognize how how precious um, is this opportunity to not only have this human birth, but also to hear the Dharma and to be able to train in the Buddhist, Buddha's way. Due to much merit from training that has been done in the past beyond our own present efforts. I find it humbling and encouraging to reflect on this. And uh, reading the Jatakamala has caused me to do so a lot. It's a stream of bodhisattva training that we're benefiting from that has brought us to practicing the Dharma and actually to being together here today. Reverend Master Jiu and and Dogen Zenji, for that matter, taught that gratitude is a particular hallmark of of our serene reflection Buddhist practice and um, is even considered to be one of the, the wisdoms that exemplify bodhisattva practice. So for us, it's a practice. Any chance we have, any chance we have to, to reflect on something with gratitude, one should take it. And um, we often think of the many faults that we have and the hard work that we have to do in this life, but we seldom think of the merit that we have received from many, many beings before us. 
and the great store of merit that's there and, and that which is also being created through the training. During Shakyamuni's early life as Prince Siddhartha or Gotama, it's said that he already had a compassionate heart towards beings. As a young child, he couldn't accept the violent customs towards animals, for example, as you know, you, most of you know the story of the Buddha. And in all accounts of his life and teaching, it's clear that after his great awakening, he tirelessly taught the Dharma and worked to help anyone who came to him, monks and lay practitioners alike, as well as devas and beings of other worlds. He spent his nights teaching sometimes. Um, so we hear, we read in all the accounts. It's said in Zen that the Buddha never ceased to wear his kesa and to carry his alms bowl. In other words, to keep the precepts, to do the training. Whether he was enlightened or not, obviously he was. Um, continuing to manifest the paramitas and humility after his enlightenment, until he died at the age of 80. So he continued on with the same training. Truly, his entire life is a great example of bodhisattva training. Historically speaking, as again most of you know, within several centuries following the life of Shakyamuni Buddha, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition gradually emerged as an expansion of the Buddha's teaching. The key aspect of the Mahayana being the development of the Bodhisattva ideal. It seems from the little that I've read, it wasn't a completely new idea, um, just a further development in approach to Buddhist practice. The Mahayana, which means great vehicle, placed emphasis on the Buddhist trainee arousing bodhicitta, the innate determination or movement towards oneness with enlightenment, not only for oneself, but for all sentient beings without exception, and that all beings and things were at heart void, in other words, empty of a separate self, unstained and pure. And that the joy and peace of nirvana was to be shared with all living things, since the fruits of training are never our personal possession, in fact, in the sense of something that we can keep just to ourselves, or should try to. So the enlightened being determines to not stay in nirvana, but to share its beauty with everyone. And bodhisattvas are called enlightened beings or enlightening beings sometimes. This approach allowed many different forms and methods of teaching to evolve according to what was most helpful in curing different types of suffering and responding to the needs of numberless beings, their different koans, countries, and cultures. Bodhisattvas became, uh, came to be seen as personifications of various aspects of Buddhahood, Oneness with universal truth. Sometimes called enlightening beings, as I've said, they offer their training for the benefit of assisting all beings to full awakening. They are not only on the path to Buddhahood, but are also aspects of the eternal Buddha nature itself. It's said that Buddhas are born of bodhisattva training. Bodhisattvas are often seen as Buddhas in their own right, uh, and sometimes they're seen as emanations of an enlightened quality of a particular Buddha. And there are many Buddhas in Buddhism and um, countless numbers of bodhisattvas assisting that Buddha that they are perhaps an emanation of, when thought of that way, in teaching and rescuing those of us in this floating world, as Zen Master Ryokan referred to samsara, this world of patience. Reverend Master Jiu taught us to, to not get caught up, caught up in the old argument about arahants and bodhisattvas, you know, whether which is better, which is higher, and so on. She, she taught that each is just on a different road to the same place, each taking a different approach. 
So I found it most helpful to remember because this argument arises every so often and um, we just try not to get involved with it. Um, I find it most helpful to remember the saying that there is no argument in the truth. In other words, if there is an argument uh, or a fight, if you like, about the teaching, about a teaching, that it is not about the truth. This is a very, very helpful thing to keep in mind when you go through, uh, when you're in conversation with people on occasion. We enter the path of Zen Buddhist training as new bodhisattvas in training, doing our best to do something about ourselves and to be considerate of others in everything we do. As we walk the path, we train ourselves in cultivating the virtues of the great bodhisattvas, opening to their enlightened qualities bringing them forth from within our own Buddha nature. Through the practice, we gradually join with their great vows. For as we cleanse ourselves of harmful tendencies, our pure heart's wish becomes freed and clarified and can function in the world. Our lives become truly beneficial to all beings. And our training becomes a field of merit. So personally, I see this, again, just to emphasize this aspect and something I'd like to bring out in our um, talks and discussions this week is that it's more of an opening to these great vows, which are already part of our bodhicitta, part of our own heart's wish, Something, not something that we have to create or fabricate. But it does involve a good deal of training. Reverend Master Ji, who strongly emphasized that bodhisattva training is not becoming merely a do-gooder in the way that our our culture uh, often thinks of helping in quotes in the world, you know, the helping hand, the infamous helping hand, sometimes unfortunately ending up with a patronizing of others or trying to fix other people's lives and minds according to our ideas, something we're all very familiar with and only natural, but it's not quite that. For Buddhists, doing good has to be grounded, as you know, in perceptual training and the insight that comes therefrom, and in an awareness of the three marks of existence, dukkha, suffering, anicca, the law of impermanence, these laws that are always at work, suffering exists and its cause, keeping that in mind, that all things are impermanent, and anatta, dukkha, anicca, and anatta, as well as there being nirvana. As Bodhidharma taught the um, emperor, great master Bodhidharma taught the emperor back in ancient China, and perhaps he taught it a little sooner than the emperor was ready for it, but what he said was, um, there's no thing that is holy. So Reverend Master clarified for us, her disciples, that a bodhisattva is not a saint in the same way that it might be thought of in the Christian sense, at least as was thought of by myself and many others whom I know. Uh, We're not trying to become special souls possessing personal holiness as, as separate entities. That, to me, becomes terribly burdensome if you think about it. There isn't and never will be something holy that is separate from the eternal Buddha. So bodhisattvas, freeing themselves of greed, anger, and delusion, become one with the great eternal and therefore naturally manifest enlightened qualities. Each one specializing in certain aspects of enlightenment, assisting in ways most needed. Great Master Kazan expresses this principle beautifully in his poem, one of his many poems in the, the Denkoroku, the transmission of the lamp, when he says, The peach tree does not know that its blossoms are red, but it leads Reun to the truth. And that's my talk for tonight to introduce our awakening to the heart of the Bodhisattva retreat. And again, just would like to welcome you. Um, And you have these folders that we handed out with some um, 
copies of the scriptures or litanies that we use at our festivals for each of these bodhisattvas that we'll be talking about. It's just for spiritual reflection, if you like, and some images, because some of us are more visually oriented and the images are helpful. Um, So you're welcome to use those for spiritual reflection when there's time, if you wish. And um, also we have great Master Dogen's chapter on um, the four wisdoms, the what he calls the um, four exemplary acts of a bodhisattva, which are the, the very important practices in our tradition and throughout Buddhism, of course. So um, there you have it. And I'm sure if you have any practical questions, the guest office would be glad to help you. You know who the guest monks are. And... Um, We're delighted to have you together in the mandala of our community this week for this retreat. I very much look forward to spending time with you, as all of us do. Thank you so much for coming. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha.